Well, hello there, everyone, and welcome back to the Alice Chalmers 8070 tractor air conditioning system project, as originally promised or threatened, depending upon how you look at things. I, of course, am your lovely host, UXW Bill, and this is going to be a video where we just kind of do a go, no-go test on this system. Those of you who watched the previous video about this will know that we have leaks in our Schrader cores. I have also since come to realize that there may be an electrical problem here because our AC off switch up in the control panel on the, in the top of the cab does not actually cut the compressor off. Fortunately, the fan switch does, so it looks like the air conditioning might well be running at all times. What a great feature that is. Anyway, I brought with me my valve core extraction tool and some replacement Schrader valve cores. Hopefully these will fit and do what we need to do. We'll also take a look at the old ones when I get them pulled out. And then we're going to see about putting nitrogen on this system, performing a basic tightness test, and if it passes that, we'll put it on the vacuum pump, and then we'll see about charging it. So stay tuned. Those are the old Schrader valve cores that were in the system, provided everything is in focus. You can just take a moment, pause the video if you want to inspect them. I don't know, there might be a little damage to that sealing material, but they don't look that bad to me. But you can also be the judge of that for yourself and just see what you think. In the meantime, I got the nitrogen hooked up, so we'll put a little, little pressure on the line here. And come over here. Bleed this out if we can. This may be a job for more than one hand. And then, I'm pretty sure we can, but we'll go ahead and we'll just flow nitrogen through the system, sending it in here, having it come out there, just a brief little purge. We could certainly still have problems. The more eagle-eyed of, of you and the viewing audience I've probably already commented on the fact that with this system being flat on gas, that there should have been a low pressure switch to cut off the compressor and keep it from running. I don't think there is a low pressure switch on this system. There's a high pressure switch, which I certainly hope works, <laughs> because we have learned in the case of the 7020, if that condenser gets covered up with all the filth that these tractors operate in, you need that high pressure switch to cut things off and save the day. Now that we've got this all hooked up, and I'll move this out so it's a little less of a tripwire, I'll go ahead and I'll run a nitrogen pressure test on the system. Just see if it holds pressure, and if it does, we'll see if those new Schrader cores are also tight like they should be. As you can see, we're 10 minutes into our tightness test, and we've actually gained a little bit of pressure, which is a result of there being refrigerant still trapped in the oil within the system. What we're going to do now is just pop these couplers off of here. And we're going to see if these are tight or if they leak. We've got some leak detector right here. This is a brand new bottle, so I have to probably, there we go, build up the pressure. And what we do here is we just look for any bubbling. Put some in this one too. This one's gonna be a little harder to do because it's sitting horizontal. We'll look very carefully for any signs of bubbling. I don't think there's any going on down there. I thought maybe I saw a little something here, but watching it now, it looks pretty much steady to me. You want to spray this stuff very slowly and deliberately because you don't want to introduce bubbles into it that could mislead you into thinking that something's leaking when it's not. I think we're probably ready to let the nitrogen out of this thing and start on the vacuum pump. Everything's all hooked up and ready to run for the vacuum pump. And today I've got this little Harbor Freight Hercules branded battery operated pump out here. I've actually used this on a couple of jobs now, and it has really given an outstanding account of itself. I was very intrigued when the NAVAC company came out with one of these, 
right up until I looked at the price. Firstborn son and a couple of kidneys. And both of those I'd be rather sensitive about. But this is a fraction of the money and seems to work every bit as well. It starts up slowly and ramps up, as you can hear. Open our vent there, open our valve. We're screwed on, we'll make sure these, li these lids are tight, these caps. And then we'll come over here and you'll probably hear the vacuum pump change as we open the system up. And now we're in the vacuum pumping business. Be able to see a little bit of mist coming out of there. That's actually the oil in the pump being atomized along with potential materials that are in the air conditioning system on the tractor. Brought a couple extra batteries with me, a little tiny one and a really, really big one that's on the charger, and then a moderately sized one that's actually running the pump. And we'll just see how long this actually takes to reach a reasonable vacuum. I'd like to see us get below a thousand microns if we can and stay there. But again, with the age of this system being what it is, that may not be a hugely realistic goal. Plus, I really don't want to have this thing on the vacuum pump for a real long time today. I know there's no such thing as too much time on the vacuum pump, and if I'd have brought my line-powered line pump out here with me, I probably would have set it out here and let it cook all night long. Because we really don't know what's been in this system, or how it's been treated over the years, or how well it was even updated and renovated for continued use. Over the course of about the past two minutes or so, it has really dropped dramatically from being in the high 10,000s. Now we're down to about 2,200 microns. Now when you see it go up like that, it's usually because there's moisture being boiled out of the system or perhaps refrigerant being pulled out of the oil or something else in the system that the vacuum pump is removing. All right, it's entirely possible some of you will disagree with this, and you certainly have that right, and you may ultimately be proven correct. I did not get into as deep of a vacuum as I really wanted to go to here, but for the time that I have to work on this today, I'm going to call it good, especially since we're in decay right now, which is to say everything's valved off, the vacuum pump has gone away, and we have held pretty steadily around 3,000 microns. If I really had my choice here, what I would do is I would put this thing on an AC line powered vacuum pump all night, but we'll see what happens. Now, of course, I have to get my vacuum pump, a vacuum pump, my micron gauge, my vacuum gauge out of line with the high side. And the way that I'm going to do this, I've bled my line all the way from here to here. We're looking for about two and a half pounds, 2.7 pounds. I wanna be a little on the low side of that based on the specs that I have found for this system using R134A. We're also going to take a look at our superheat and subcooling numbers just to see what they look like. This is also a thermostatic expansion valve based system. So we will probably, if everything is working well, actually see that thermostatic expansion valve modulating the superheat as this system operates. So we'll go ahead and we'll just slip a little bit of refrigerant in there to break the vacuum. On the low side, we'll valve this off. I much prefer putting the vacuum gauge in line with the hose leading up to the manifold as opposed to having it in line like this. But of course, this doing it that way will make it rather less accurate. That's not actually the line I want to take off. This is the line I want to take off right here. See, I get carried away talking on the video. I don't want that to fall down on the ground in the dirt. And here again, sometimes you really do need two hands to do these things. I'll put this aside over here because we should be done with it. And we'll 
we'll screw this on. Again, if I can do it one-handed, which apparently is not guaranteed here. Now, I've got this valve closed, and I'm going to open this one up, and we're going to bleed up to here so that, again, we don't get a bunch of crap in the system. Then we'll open this up. And we'll just see how much the system will take in under a vacuum. And once I've gotten to the point where it won't take any more under vacuum, we'll start the engine and we'll let the compressor help us put the rest of it in. All right, we're just crossed over to one pound, a little over one pound. All right, so it almost took the entire thing under vacuum. Go ahead and crank it up and turn on the air conditioning all the way. Should do it right now? Yep, go ahead. Okay, air conditioning wide open, fan wide open. And I hope we're out of gear, otherwise some stuff's going to go for a ride. <laughs> Let's see. I need to be up there. Now I'll just meter the rest of it in. Going down. About 68. We're at two pounds of refrigerant right now. Here's our outdoor ambient temperature. I say like you can hear me over the racket that engine's making. Holy crap, that thing is loud. <laughs> so I've taken a couple steps back here to point out what I forgot. And that's the fact that with the sides of the tractor off, we need to restore the airflow over that condenser coil. So now I've done that. It's not great, but it'll work with a torn up cardboard box. And that brought the head pressure right down, which is what we needed. We're at about 30 ounces, and I'm awaiting a check of the in cap temperature. Probably not gonna go a whole lot further than that. We'll see. Also still need to pull the superheat and subcooling and see what they look like. Headphone users, I'm going to give you fair warning. Turn your volume control rather sharply down because I don't know that even the iPhone's automatic microphone gain control is going to be able to rein in what you're about to hear. Well, I definitely think I got my fair share of sun today. <laughs> but all goofing around aside, for those of you who have been following along in the video and saw those superheat and subcooling numbers, didn't like them, I'm right there with you. They're both way too high to my way of thinking. I think there's a couple of possible explanations for that. We'll go into some of them here shortly. And time will tell if I'm right or I'm wrong. First of all, there's the fact that that system is well over 40 years old and it's no longer running on its original refrigerant. It's also running on the components that were in it when the tractor was purchased, which may not be the best idea ever. I was also not taking my measurements in the most ideal locations because I could not get there with the wiring on my sensor probes or without substantial disassembly of the tractor in the case of superheat. I would, of course, certainly welcome your thoughts. I do not claim to know everything. I am about the furthest thing there is from knowing everything. In other words, I am not a super tech, 
And I would appreciate that the dialogue be kept constructive because this can be a learning experience for everyone, myself included. Especially since, as previously noted, although I have done a fair amount of this work, I am certainly still very much learning. In fact, I think any of us who pursue any sort of career in any sort of field, we're always learning. The day you stop learning is probably the day that you have left this plane of existence, or more simply put than that, you have passed away. In any event, folks, before I get too philosophical or theological or whatever I might be getting there, as always, I would certainly welcome your constructive commentary. If you think I got it wrong, certainly do feel free to tell me. I enjoy engaging in dialogue with folks in the comments because, again, I feel we can all definitely learn something from that if you would be so inclined as to leave a constructive comment. And, of course, thank you, as always, for watching. Of course, you should always also make sure that your air filters are clean, too. That one's from 2009, and they say replace it every six months. That will definitely mess up your superheat and your pressures. You get extra points if you caught the misspelling of element in that cautionary notice. We do not know where that restriction indicator is within the cab of the tractor. But, uh, yeah, pretty much. Definitely should have taken care of that. Gosh, I sure hope that parking brake still releases. This is possible, probably. The things we resort to when we don't have a ladder... Headphone users, you are again cautioned to turn down your listening volume because I turning this thing up to 11. This filter is a little newer than the other one from 2012. It means it's almost a brand new unit. Here we go. Actually, we need to turn that around. <laughs> You're going to have to devise a better hold down mechanism here. We're going to devise it all right. thought that would be a little more impressive than it was. <laughs> and for those of you in the audience who are wondering, Alice Chalmers does say that those elements are serviceable in this fashion. They also say that they're washable, but I don't think we're going to do that today. This one we already pounded oh, quite a lot of dust out of, so it'll be interesting to see how this one compares. <laughs> certainly ought to be a considerable improvement, I don't mind telling you. So we're going to go ahead and replace the worst of the two filters because we actually have a brand new one. Yeah, this was the worst of the two.